This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 2, Episode 24 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast. We explore the ideas and dreams behind some of the leading entrepreneurs from around the world. Along the way, we will give you some tips and ideas of how you can chase your own big ideas and dreams and change the world around you. Our guest on today's episode is Captain Jim Palmer. More about Captain Palmer in a moment. Our guest on Thursday's episode is Walter O'Brien. If you've ever seen the show Scorpion, you'll know that the show is based on a guy named Walter O'Brien. We get to talk to the real Walter O'Brien, who the show is based on, and we go deep into a lot of amazing topics like AI, VI, innovation, and technology for the future. I think you're going to love this episode, so make sure to check out Thursday's episode with Walter O'Brien. The Jumble Think Podcast can be found on all of your favorite places to listen to podcasts. Places like iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, TuneIn, and so many other incredible places. You can find links to many of the best places to listen to the podcast at jumblethink.com. Now let's go over, click that subscribe button so you never miss another episode of the Jumble Think Podcast. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host and so excited for today's episode. Before we get going into the Jumble Think episode for today, I want to make sure that you know about some free resources we're giving away right now to you, the listener. The two guides we're giving away right now are How to Know When You've Found Your Dream and Overcoming the Unknown. All you have to do is swing on over to jumblethink.com slash guide. Again, that's jumblethink.com slash guide. On that page, you'll find both of the guides for your free download. Now let's learn a little bit more about Captain Jim Palmer. My name is Jim Palmer. I'm known as Captain Jim, the Dream Business Coach, and I, uh, I'm the founder of the Dream Business Academy and the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. We help entrepreneurs and small business owners build the dream business that they want so they can live their dream lifestyle. I knew this is what I was created to do when I ran my very first live event and I saw what an impact I was having, which is quite different today from what a lot of entrepreneurs do, kind of sitting behind either a microphone or a screen or just relying on social media <laughs> for the interaction. And that was such a powerful, it was such a powerful moment. I I've been, I'd, had been doing it for quite a while at that time, uh, but that really solidified this is, wow, this is what I was really made to do. I realized I was a good coach when I helped my first uh, coaching client double the size of their business. And then I did it a second and a third time. And I realized at that point also that that was really what I was called to do. Because I think you can create success for yourself. But then when you kind of take that skill or talent and help somebody else do it for themselves, that's, that's really the magic part of a dream business. Well, it matters because, you know, the first line in the purpose driven life is it's not about you. Now, it's I think if you focus only on yourself and only creating success for yourself and not what that business can do for others, either from the revenue you generate or again, sharing and uh, finding a way to serve others with that skill and talent, that's um, that's why it matters, because the the more you can touch others other than just your bank account, I think is is the ultimate in significance. Okay, so I'm currently looking to overcome uh, two things. I'll give you one semi silly, but actually very real. I'm I'm willing. I'm trying hard to overcome the Wi-Fi situation living on a boat because my clients uh, very much insist on uh, seeing me. We do a lot of video conferencing, and probably the other, um, probably more significant challenge is figuring out where to do my events because we live on a boat and we don't have a car here. So, you know, we rent, we do Uber, and we got to figure out where we're going to fly to. So logistically, running that part of my business is, is a little bit of a challenge. Exactly what I just touched on. Our next big goal is uh, my next event, which is in San Diego, end of September. So we're about six or seven months away. And again, I'm trying to figure out how to make all that work being on a boat and not being in touch quite as easily with staff and support people and things like that. We'll be right back with the interview portion of our conversation with Captain Jim Palmer. So you have a big idea and dream, but you don't know where to start. Jumble Think is here to help you. We'd love to sit down with you and talk about that big idea and dream and give you some practical tools to make that dream a reality. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash consulting. Again, that's jumblethink.com slash consulting to learn how we can help you. Now let's jump back into our interview with Captain 
Jim Palmer. Our guest today is Jim Palmer. Jim, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I, uh, I really like your show, Michael. In our inbox, we often get emails where, hey, I know a great guest or, hey, here's a guy I'd like to connect you with if it's somebody that, that books uh, guests on our podcast. And uh, so often I look at their one sheets and uh, a one sheet is basically an overview of who they are, some topics they talk about and everything like that. And, and I look at it and go, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And I got yours and I just remember going, this is going to be a lot of fun. So I'm super <laughs> excited to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you. And and I made sure with the one sheet, which is kind of modeled off my seventh book, just say yes, I made sure <laughs> it had Captain Jim and it had a picture of my boat because I'm just like you. I do a lot of interviews myself, Mike. And it's like, oh, here's yeah. one more person that's going to tell you how to convert and do this and do that. <laughs> you know, a lot of the same stuff. Well, and, and I, I think what you just said there is really powerful. So often, especially when we're talking to digital marketing strategists, it's all about converting or you know connecting with your audience and building audience and blah 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 and and often we forget what really matters and that's designing the life that we want to live on our terms and you're doing it so tell us a little bit about that yeah so it's been a year actually as you and i are doing this my wife wow. um she left a career in uh, early childhood development after like 30 years. Um, and we've been living in the same house for almost that same amount of time. We, we raised four kids. They're all our youngest kids are 30. So they're all grown and gone. And, and, you know, because, uh, what I do for a living, I can do it anywhere as long as I got Wi-Fi and a, and a cell phone reception. So she came home one day, Mike, and said, Hey, I think it's time for a big adventure. And I had no idea what wow. she was thinking about. And you yeah. know, kind of a, I won't go into the entire story because for time, but ultimately we decided that, how fun would it be if we live on a boat? Now we we owned a boat at the time, but it was a smaller boat. Yeah, love spending weekends on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, and yeah. and you know, so we kind of you know, of course, you knew me being me. I said, well, we're going to need a bigger boat, <laughs> the old <laughs> the old line and jaws. Yeah, but you know, we ended up buying a fifty foot boat. I've wow. never driven a fifty foot boat with two big diesel engines and you know the whole nine yards we sold our house we moved on the boat and started figuring out how little we knew about living and, and taking this boat out in the ocean our literally our first major voyage of this boat was driving the boat up from uh, Maryland up to Rhode Island and that means being out in the open ocean off the yeah. coast of Jersey and pulling into New York Harbor and right. there's ferries zooming left and right going out to Liberty <laughs> Island tons of commercial traffic and I'm like oh my god and when we got to Rhode Island I I think I joked with you before we went live here, Michael, but we got to Rhode Island after three long, intense days, and I literally got off, and, and I, I kissed the dock. <laughs> I said, we're not taking this boat out for a month. <laughs> but, you know, the, the the lesson there, and there's there's so many stories, right. and of course, we can make them all humorous, but, you know, it's it's why I wrote my last book was Just Say Yes, and I think so many people, they get stuck in this what they think is the safe and predictable way to live your life. And um, Stephanie came up with a great saying for our blog, which we share about our, our boating experiences from predictable and reliable to exciting and adventurous. I'm pretty sure that's close, but you know, it was kind of like that. And you know, it was interesting. We told so many people, friends and neighbors right. that we've known forever. We told them we're doing this. There was no gray air. There was either, a, a one answer or the extreme of another which is either that's amazing i i think that's awesome or what the hell are you doing <laughs> and 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 again i think that's um it's one of the things i i you know I, i'm gonna be 60 but when i when i talk with millennials and 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 things like gen xers one of the things that i think i have in common at 60 with some of the, some younger generations is they are seeking a lot of adventure in their life too michael yeah. i know you know that yeah. you've, been, you've interviewed several but and it's interesting um one of the things that helped us to just say yes to this, because believe me, we didn't just willy nilly say yes. We really had to think about it, research it, and we did our due diligence. Right. A lot of things said don't do it, but we did it anyway because we didn't want to have that regret later on in life. Um, whether I worked another five years or 10 years, you get into retirement, who knows what your health situation will be. And I sometimes joke with Stephanie, by the time we can afford to do this or want to do this or decide to do it. I don't want to be so old. I step in the boat and break my brittle bones, you know? <laughs> so we're sort of enjoying life now. 
I mean, I still work. I, I'm very, very blessed with my business. I work three days a week with my clients. But other than that, I mean, we're kind of we're kind of in, enjoying life like you think you might do after after you retire, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I love what you said there. You know, we buy into this lie of the safe path. And I think more than ever, people are questioning that because our jobs aren't secure. The whole concept of retirement, especially for those uh, of us that are younger, you know, in their their 30s and even 40s are looking at retirement and going, you know, I don't want to live for one day. I want to live for everything I can do today because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. And whether it's illness, whether it's an accident, uh, this whole concept of safety, living safe is becoming uh, something that I think mo most people are having to really reckon with. Yeah. I mean, I was 41 years old and I was, I, I had cancer at 41 wow. and I, for about three weeks before my surgery, I didn't know whether my chances based on the averages were my chance of being alive in five years was either going to be 80, 20 or 50, 50. Obviously wow. I'm, I'm still very much alive. So I'm grateful for that, but it really makes you realize at that point, and believe me at 41, I was still trying to work in my career. I was hard driving, figuring if anybody asked me and nobody did, how long you think you're going to live? I would have said, well, probably midlife I'll be 80 plus <laughs> never in my wildest dreams that I have to contemplate contemplate it could be a whole lot shorter than that and right in, in a weird way i look at that as a real gift michael i hated going through it but it made me realize you've got to live every day because tomorrow really isn't guaranteed yeah and and to keep working and saving and being safe for that for that sometimes illusional period in your life where you're gonna kick back and do whatever you want to do i it's interesting. We see so many people out here. I, the term is called a liveaboard. So we see a lot of full-time liveaboards at okay. the marinas we're in, and and I, it's it's interesting that we see uh, old people who are much older than us, and they're obviously retired, and some a few people like us who are liveaboards and still work, whether it's remotely or some live on their boat and work wherever. We are, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But there's also younger people. We met this couple in Rhode Island in a marina we we're staying at, and he had been 15 years with UPS. So if he, let's just, I think he was in his mid thir mid to 30s, like 38 or I think. Okay. Is. And they they both quit their job and bought like a 30 foot sailboat. Wow. And for three months while we we're up there, they were rehabbing it. Well, they took off, and and you know we kind of stayed in touch with them. In fact, when we were in Maryland in October, kind of waiting for that hurricane season to end before we headed south <laughs> yeah they stopped and you know we had dinner together we saw them twice on the way down going south now they're down they're down in the bahamas yeah and you know the caribbean and they're having a great time but i think that they said i don't they both said we don't know how long we'll be able to do this we think we can go at least a year and a half but if we really learn how to live this lifestyle and earn a little money along the way maybe we'll do it longer wow. and it's like i said I don't know if I could have done that when I was your age. First of all, I, I had four kids by the time I was 27. Right. But um, but to do this, just to really take take life by the horns and live it, I, I really admire that. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's something that's interesting is you have a, a big portion of your life uh, in the workforce. I think it's like 30 years, whether it was different entrepreneurial journeys, working in the world of marketing, uh, small business coaching, you've, you've been in the business world doing traditional business. Now you're a year out kind of living your own uh, choices uh, instead of kind of going along the, 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 the typical journey. How does it feel now looking back compared uh, this past year against the previous 30 on, on just the experience and how it, how it feels? It feels different. Okay. Right. And I think I, I wouldn't say one is better and you couldn't trade one for the other. And, right. You know, my wife is so, uh, she always straightens me out along my journey here. <laughs> and early on, I remember this, and this kind of almost has nothing to do with it, but I think I'll bring it home is, you know, when we had kids really young and when you have four kids and you're like 28 years old, there's not a lot of time for you know, the time for being a couple is kind of like put yeah. on hold because you're in that family mode. Right. And she let, she helped me understand that this is a different time. We're in our kid time now and there'll be time for us later on. So I think whether that's your career or your home life, there's different stages of your life. Everything I did in my 20s and my 30s and up till, you know, 41 when I started my first business led me to be able to do what I'm doing now. So it doesn't make one thing better. It makes it very different. What's really interesting for us is that 
we wake every day. I mean, we're getting a little used to it, but every day it feels like we're on vacation. <laughs> you know, when you go on vacation right. and, and you do something, every day is great because you're waking up. And even though I, I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but I wake up on a boat and I, I look at the sun coming up out the front window <laughs> and I look at the sun go down and I love boats. I, I mean, I'll be working. I'll hear somebody fire up their engines. I'm running up the stairs to see who it is. I'm yeah. what kind of boat it yeah. is. And it, it's like, it just it's almost like a surreal pinch me moment. Okay. But I I think you get to have those moments only when you step into that scary part. Yeah. I think when people one of the things I wrote about in the book was when people are contemplating a big move, whether it be in business or life or whatever, I think you get emotionally uh, engaged with the idea, um, almost romantically, like, this is going to be great. <laughs> it's all you can think about. Right. Maybe your heart's pitter-patter, right? Yeah. <laughs> like when you first met someone special. And it's like, it's going to be great. And then what happens is the what-ifs kick in. Yeah. The part where we learn, whether it's from our parents or teachers or somebody told us to think about, yeah, but what if. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And for me, the what ifs, what if I can't drive a big boat? What if I run aground? What if I run out of fuel? <laughs> what if I hit something and damage the boat? Right. I have done all of those already in a year. <laughs> and I'm, we're still here. And as I say to Steph, and jokingly, sometimes, hey, we're still afloat. We didn't sink yet. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's never going to be as bad as as you think right. when you're playing the what ifs. Right. And Michael, I got to share this. One of the things that helped us say yes to this, even after we sort of said yes and moving forward, getting the house ready for sale, but in the back of your head going, yeah, but what if, what if? I read this book and the guy actually said people think about living on a boat and the romantic part of it and the sunrise, sunset and all that. And they think about things like I just said to you. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, but what if what if you go through those and you somehow you, somebody pulls you off the sandbar and you, you <laughs> they bring you out fuel right. and you hit something and you get it fixed. But what if you just have the adventure of a lifetime yeah. that you would not have if all you do is sit there contemplating what could go wrong? That was really a personal turning point for me. And from then forward, no matter – that was about July or August of last year when we started looking for the for the boat and, and putting our house on the market. I never looked back. And it was so funny. Wow. The very second time I drove that boat, I ran aground right in front of the marina. Oh. <laughs> and all these people are on the dock looking, and we had the guy come out in his boat and tow us off. Oh. And it was just <laughs> – and I said, all right, take that one off the list, yeah. you know. <laughs> And they make the best stories too, because now you have something that people just go, wow, how'd you get through that? Or, wow, that's incredible. Or experiences that they dream of, you get to experience. And and you also get to experience those frustrating and scary moments too of running aground, running out of gas and hitting your different stumbling blocks along the way. But what you're really talking about is making a choice to architect the life you want to live. And moving yes. past the what ifs. So let's start with what ifs, because I think that's really good. There are what ifs that are good what ifs to say, okay, that's a good one to like, maybe like, what if I walk into a lion cage, I might die. That's probably a good what if to go, that's probably one I should stay away from. But there's what other what ifs that actually lead us away from our dreams. How do we distinguish the two? And how do we get to the right place in that process? You know, um, I, I, I was 28 years old. So this goes way, way back. And I took the Dale Carnegie course because oh. I wanted help with public speaking yeah. and confidence. I mean, I, I don't even know if they do the same thing, but way back then it was like a 12 week program. <laughs> and one of the books that Dale Carnegie wrote was how to stop worrying and start living. Right. And I don't know if it's a 200 page book, but this I still carry with me today. When you start playing the what if game, think of what the think of what is going to be the worst possible outcome. Right. Prepare to accept it and then work so it doesn't happen. So to me, it was like, well, what if I do run aground? I don't think anybody ever died from that. It's <laughs> other than embarrassment. And the same thing with running out of fuel. I'd have somebody tow us into Atlantic City. And and what about the, and I, hit, I hit the dock putting it in on a windy day and it caused $800 worth of damage. I've done all yeah. of that. And and, and, and so if, if you think about it in your life or in, in my vocation, what I help people with it, entrepreneurs, but Jim, what if I spend this money and it doesn't work? Well, what if it doesn't work? Then we know yeah. that's not the path and we'll choose another one. Yeah. And But I don't have the money. Well, guess what? Nobody gets to build a dream business or a business that's really successful unless you put some skin in the game and put yourself out there. Yeah. I did a training the other day, Michael. I kind of related that. I called it 
because I like coming up with kind of provocative titles. It's kind of what we do as marketers. <laughs> right. But I said, you're expecting paid traffic results with a free market mentality. In other right. words, you just want to post to Facebook and think that's going to drive a bunch of people your way. <laughs> or, you know, you're going to build a list by just putting up a blog post instead of actually doing some Facebook marketing or pay-per-click or whatever it takes. In other words, you have to be willing to invest if you're going to expect some bigger results. I think that's really, really good. I'm just writing a note down here of, of like, I love that. Willing to invest for success. How do you figure out where to invest so that you can get successful and that, that risk? You're taking the risk. You're jumping in. Now you're, you're looking at it and going, I've got to invest into my dream. I've got to invest into my idea. Where do you start learning the right way to do that? You, here's what you want to do. And I've done it the other way. By the way, when I'm training or coaching or teaching and I say, I have done all of these, that's why I can speak with such <laughs> forcefulness and, and not being embarrassed because I'm not calling anybody out because I've called myself out. Right. But what you really want to do is figure out, um, uh, you want to find a mentor who has done <laughs> what it is you want to do. That's good. And that usually requires an investment. I mean, sometimes somebody would be nice enough to go to lunch with you or just have a conversation, but it really requires more than that. And, um, you know, when, you, when you're trying to figure that piece of it out, I, I think everybody that starts a business as an entrepreneur has a certain skill or talent, whether you're, whether you're a landscaper or a bricklayer or, you know, or an, an SEO coach, or you, you build websites, whatever it is, you have a skill and a talent. And so you, you go and you get a client or two at the local chamber of commerce. Next thing you know, you've got three or four clients. And maybe if you're lucky, you keep growing, but then you have to become an accountant. You have to become a, a, a <laughs> director of marketing, right. you have to become the salesperson, you have to do every other thing that's required to grow a business other than the skill or talent that you bring to the table. Yeah. Now, most people, what I what I believe, based on my own experience in doing this for so long, most people are too cheap to do that, right? Because they're, again, they're going to fear, well, what if that's five grand or 10 grand or 50 grand, whatever it is, what if it doesn't work out? But right. yeah, what if it does? And the turning point for me, Michael, was when when I got, I got very tired of what I called slow to no growth. I was doing okay, paying bills, but I really wanted to really significantly grow my business and pay down my debt and just, you know, create this financial freedom. And it wasn't happening as fast as I wanted to. And so I did invest. I, be, I was in this um, mastermind group with some really smart people who had already had major success in the area that I was looking to grow, which was in the coaching space. Right. Um, and one person called me aside and this person had, had a multi-million dollar coaching business. And he said, you know, Jim, luckily it was on a break and not in front of everybody. <laughs> I, I actually call this, Michael, my most embarrassing moment. So the, okay. the, the people who are listening to your show should listen to this. So if you want to save yourself some embarrassment, listen from my story. <laughs> and so he pulled me aside. And he goes, Jim, I got to ask you a question. I said, sure. He goes, I, I understand that you want to, you know, significantly grow your coaching practice, but I want to ask you, what makes you think you're entitled to achieve the same level of success that perhaps me or other people in this room have achieved, but yet you're not willing to do the things that we have done to grow our business and to keep growing them? Mm. What makes you think that's reasonable or possible? Yes. And what he was doing, he was trying to be a little bit delicate, but, you know, th those folks who have really, they do their own live events, they do seminars, they go out and do speaking, they're authors, they're, you know, at the time video was kind of new, but they're doing, they're doing all these things that I was honestly a little bit too too much of a wuss to be doing. <laughs> and, and I, you know, Michael, I wasn't stepping up. I, in my own head, I envisioned, these guys, my competitors, my compatriots, whatever, these guys were zooming down the, the passing lane of the highway. Right. And I was either in the right hand lane or when it came to some things, I was in I was in the uh, soft shoulder okay. because but in my head, I said, I'm going to be very successful, but I'm going to do it not doing those things. I had a real massive fear of public speaking. And, um, and, you know, I, so I, I was going to do this without being a speaker. And, and the last, the last big demon that I had to slay was doing my own live events. When you put on your own live events, before you sell the first ticket, you have to sign a, a contract with a hotel. You have to guarantee a certain number of sleeping rooms. You have to pay a certain amount for food and beverage. It's a big deal, right? right? right. I, I run what I call a boutique size event. It's about a 30 grand investment. So to put 30 grand on a line, 
and and if you don't sell any rooms, they still want you to pay for them. <laughs> and so it's a big deal. Right. And that, that was the last bit, what I call the last big demon that I had to slay, wow. Michael. And, yeah. and when I finally did it, and I, I had my own event, and I got 28 people there, and it was a, it was a fairly good success. That's what I mentioned earlier in this interview. I said, that's when I knew this is what I was supposed to do because I really was able to touch a lot of lives. And I saw people that were just taking, getting breakthroughs from me sharing in a very personal way. So anyway, that's probably a long answer to your question. But if somebody does want to go from where they are now to something much, much bigger, find somebody who's already done that. And in today's terms, that's like, you know, pressing the button on your iPhone and saying, Hey, Sari, how do I get to this restaurant in, you know, <laughs> East Jabip? Right. And she goes, Oh, oh, here we go. Is this it? Okay. Follow these directions. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, go to a mentor. How do I build a business? That's three times the size of my current one. This is what you're going to do. Right. And that comes at a price. And that's what usually scares people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and fear is one of those things that, uh, you just got to bite the bullet and just take the risk sometimes. Yep. You, you, and it's, and it's necessary, but you know, there's a statistic and I, I, I try to motivate and I, I love to inspire, but the fact is 80% of small business owners fail within the first five years. That's a statistic that's as old as probably 80 or a hundred years. <laughs> and it'll probably keep going that way. Yeah. And you know, when, in, in general conversation in the business world, you always hear this term around election time. You hear about the top 1% or the top 5%. In business terms, the people that are in the top 1% or the top 5% of income earners, those are people that are willing to go all in. Those are people willing to do certain things to achieve a certain level of success that other people are not willing to do. Yeah, You know what I mean? It's like, it's like the guy, Fred Smith, who started Federal Express. I don't know if anybody else had the idea before him, <laughs> right. but w when he started that business, Michael, he didn't just test out his theory with a, a couple of used Cessna planes in and around Tennessee, Arkansas, and Kentucky. He invested in multiple DC-9 jets, pilots, yeah. co-pilots, yeah. ground crews, vans. I mean, he was losing millions and millions of dollars until he started turning a corner somewhere around the month month eight, I believe. Wow. And he started breaking even, and yeah. I mean, he's he's multi multi-millionaire and it's very much an american success story but could you imagine if he said yeah but what if no one wants to send a letter overnight you know? <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and i mean that that gives into the other thing is seeing what others are missing because in the case of the the fedex uh story here he was able to see what others weren't how can we get that vision that we're on the right path i mean it's one thing to take the risk but uh, what are some steps we can take to really know that we're on the right journey? It's interesting. I think that I do believe everybody's born with a, with a God-given skill or talent. Right. And I think some people are visionaries and, and creatives. And then there's other people who are doers and that's not like what we need both. Right. right. But yeah. not everybody can be. So if you're a doer, man, I just, you just work, work, work. You've got a great work ethic. You've actually built a very, but you know, you need other people to kind of paint a picture of what else you could do with this business. So first of all, not everybody's a visionary. What One of the things you could do that would help you if you're not quite a visionary is to become part of a mastermind group, yeah. which is a group of, it could be four, it could be 12 people, other entrepreneurs. And I, I happen to like mastermind groups that have a mix of people. Yeah. I mean, men and women, but also online, offline businesses oh, okay. at different levels <laughs> of success. Because- one of the things I found, you know, I've been in business for 17 years now, is sometimes we tend to get jaded. Yeah. Oh, I tried that. That doesn't work. Yeah. Well, maybe somebody else is doing something that's just been doing it for three years and goes, yeah, but you didn't try it this way. <laughs> and when you're part of a mastermind group and it's everybody's kind of sharing what's working, what's not, pitching and pulling for each other, that's a very powerful thing. The other thing, if you just want to do it on your own, I have a, a meme that I put up every once in a while on social media it says, I've never had a brilliant idea sitting in my office. In other words, if all you're doing is looking at your, your computer or your smartphone, that's very limited in scope. Yeah. For me, uh, being by the ocean, which thankfully I'm pretty close to it right now. And, and if I, if I'm in my office, I got a little uh, desk right down here in the salon of the boat, but if I'm feeling a little funky or not inspired, or I just need, I will go up and I'll sit on the, in the captain's chair and I'll look out and I can can just see I can see the horizon yeah. and it, so other people may like to go sit on top of a mountain in Virginia or something I don't know so what you need to do on a personal level is get outside of your normal space because even if it's a 
20 by 30 room that you have, it's still <laughs> limited by the walls. Right. So go sit out in the backyard or go to a park, go to the ocean, go to a lake, go somewhere where, and then just think. And you, and you know, there's a lot of things we can go into if we had time about the subconscious mind, stuff like that, but <laughs> at least go outside and go for a walk, yeah. go drive a car. I used to get a lot of ideas when I'd walk my dog in the afternoon because wow. you know, there's no, nothing's ringing and yeah. where I'm walking them in the woods and I'm, and you know, just sort of taking it and go, Oh, I wonder where that came from. <laughs> Some idea just flowed because I wasn't <laughs> looking at all the different things I got to look at. Well, I think taking that one step further, what you're you're really hitting on is the fact that breaking routine and getting out of the things that are are right ahead of you, the the normal things that you're buried in. Uh, it's so easy to get buried into our emails or the to do lists or the meetings or the production that we have to put out for for whatever work we're doing that. Uh, we're not taking that time to really break away from the everyday and and see the bigger picture. It's very true. Yeah. And that's why live events, by the way, Michael, are so important. You know, going to seminars and meeting with other people, even if you're painfully shy, sit in the back and look at the listen to the different <laughs> speakers, listen to people who get up and ask questions. Right. I mean, you put yourself in an environment where the, where there is growth happening, where right. there's optimism, right? right? You put yourself in that environment and not every event is $2,000. You can go to some pretty good events and, and just listen to people, but, and then people go, well, I'm going to do it online. So I don't <laughs> want to fly. Well, you're still looking at your frigging computer in your office, right, right. Get, get out there and interact with people who, and, and there's going to be some of them who are doing really well. Right. Well, and you mentioned before at the, at, at the top of the interview, when you're sharing your story about that first time you did your speaking events and in-person mm -hmm. event and how that was just like, wow, so illuminating to you. Let's talk a little bit about the face-to-face -face versus the virtual world, because we're moving rapidly more and more every second into a world bound by the virtual instead of the experiences in the real every day. You know, it, it, it is it is a great tool, but it's in my opinion, and here comes old old 60 year old Jim, <laughs> it's becoming a crutch. Right. You know, the technology that's at, at our disposal is becoming a, a crutch. And I think what people do, some of my clients that are doing very, very well, I actually have to teach them or remind them, I'll sell be kind. I remind them about the power of the telephone. Yeah. You know. Oh, Jim, I'd like to do this. Can what kind of email or what should I do? I said, you should get on the phone with yeah. your top 10 clients. Yeah. Check it with them, see what's going on, thank them for their business, let them know how important they are, and then say, hey, can I run something by you? And then share something. That is a strategy that has never failed to produce results for people is picking up the phone. Because a lot of people that I, I, I coach, Michael, they're not just local. Otherwise, I'd say go take somebody out to lunch. Go take your clients to lunch. But, you know, if, if you live in uh, Harrisburg and you got a client in Los Angeles, you're not going to go take <laughs> right, them out to right. lunch. <laughs> but, but you can call them. Yeah. In an email or a tech. Oh, that's the other thing. Text messaging. Yeah. You know, to send a text to somebody, hey, I've got this great program, thought you'd be interested. Well, what makes you think I want to open the next text if all you're doing is <laughs> texting me opportunities to right. buy something? Right. But, but when you have a conversation, and that's what's so powerful about podcasts like yours and like mine, Michael, is that you get to, if somebody was to read the transcript, I don't know if you put out transcripts, but they're going to read and they'll probably learn something. But to listen to our conversation and to hear how I get excited about living on my boat and different, you know, inflection and tonality and stuff. That's where the magic happens. And so that's only something that can happen when you're talking either face to face or at least on the telephone. I completely agree with that. And I think there's some people that I drive crazy, uh, good friends that they're like, Oh, you could have just texted me. I'm like, but I get to talk to you and we mm -hmm. probably are going to talk about something that needs to be said. Uh, that we wouldn't have done via text because it's all data-based. And if you were to think about, if people listening were to think about the last one, two, or three times a relationship went bad, think about how much email or texting was involved. Wow. And even an innocent comment or question, you think of it one way in your head as you're writing it, but they're reading it yeah. differently. Yeah, Like you could say, what are you doing tomorrow? And, 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 and they're going, what are you doing tomorrow? You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, people just do that. That's yeah. our, just our humanness. Right. Yeah. And so 
that's and so if you pick up the phone, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? There's no there's no ill will in that tone right. <laughs> that I'm doing on the phone. Yeah. I so agree with that. I want to pivot here for a second. One of the things I wanted to talk about was you are passionate about multiple streams of revenue for being successful yes. in building your business. What does that mean and what's it look like? So multiple streams of revenue, um, I, I, I say if you've got a successful business and your core business is doing well, you're going to sleep at night. But if you have multiple streams of revenue, you're going to sleep like a baby <laughs> because every every business has um, seasons or every yeah. business might be cyclical. And um, so I learned this when I, when I became an entrepreneur in 2001, uh, I created my first business where I was really – a, a local business. But then in 2007, when I created my first internet business called No Hassle Newsletters, and from there, my clients would start asking me for different things like, hey, can I, can you recommend a writer? You got all these writers writing your newsletters. Can you recommend somebody um, to, I need some articles done. Something in my brain said I could make a referral or I could create a revenue stream. Yeah. And so I, I took my writers, I created a very simple website called Custom Article Generator, and people can go there and, and pay. And then my writers just write the article, send it to them, and I get a little taste off the top. It's pretty cool. And then um, the next thing is uh, No Hassle Newsletters really started growing. And I wrote my first book called The Magic of Newsletter Marketing, okay. Michael. And people were like, hey, can you recommend a printer? Because I love your your templates and the content you're sharing my newsletter's ready to go out but i know you want it printed a certain way and use the right kind of paper and blah 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 and i thought hmm all these people there somebody's going to need to print their newsletters <laughs> so i i partnered with a buddy of mine yeah. who was printing all my newsletters in my first business yeah. and i said i'm going to start putting a bunch of orders your way some of them may be 200 some of them may be 2000 a lot in between i want to have a fixed price list and then I'll know what my costs are. And then I, I put a markup and I created a website called uh, Newsletter Printing Service. And now you know, we started printing a bunch of newsletters. Yeah. So, and I have done that with No House Social Media. I mean, all these different companies, I just started creating based on what my customers were asking for. And I don't mean asking like, Jim, can you do this? But I'm very attuned to opportunities to increase my, my sales and my profit. So multiple streams of revenue are, are very good in a business. And a lot of people think, well, how do I do that? Yeah. Well, first of all, you start listening, but, the, and then the ultimate stream of revenue, which provides my, my current lifestyle is around 2009. After I'd, I'd started and grown like four different internet businesses, people, how are you doing all that? Yeah. That was them asking, how are you doing how are you creating all these different businesses? That's when I started my coaching program, Michael. Okay. And for two or three years, I had for my first year, I had seven clients and I had 12 and 15. That's, and at that point when I was like, man, I, I want to grow faster. That's when I <laughs> joined that mastermind that I told you about earlier. Right. Now I have about 47 clients yeah. that, I, that I coach. So each time along the way, I was looking at, by the way, the other important thing about our, um, uh, different streams of revenue, Okay. it's most advantageous if your different revenue streams can be served by the same client base okay so if you let's say you're a bricklayer and you want to start a, a landscaping business and by the way i'm also very fond of boats i'm going to start a boat waxing business <laughs> all those might be good businesses but it's pretty rare that they're going to be you can market each business to the same customer base right for me uh, people who buy my newsletters obviously need blog posts and so the custom articles, they're going to need their newsletters printed. And and by the way, those people that are using all of those are usually entrepreneurs. So therefore, they're going to be interested in my coaching because they're trying to grow their own business. So a lot of the revenue streams that I was able to create, uh, have I've been enjoying success because there's market because each business is marketable to the same customer base. Yeah, there's synergy between each of the businesses. There's, yeah, that's a word I couldn't figure <laughs> out how to say. Synergy is a good thing. So you're not saying, hey, you should, uh, if you're in the world of web, you should go off and get into the world of real estate. And if you're in the world of real estate, maybe you should go in and get into the world of digital marketing. And if you're in digital marketing, maybe you should become a lawyer. You're not saying that kind of revenue streams. You're saying that that you should build a business around core offerings and those offerings are different revenue streams uh, different services but they all feed from the same customer base or similar customers 
it, in my view, that's the best way to do it. Okay. But I know a good friend of mine who was in my program. He's a, a former dentist who now invests in real estate. And so he has multiple revenue streams from rental properties, apartment buildings, et cetera. And what he does, his coaching business is helping other dentists yeah. follow that model. So if you're a dentist and now you're going to be a real estate investor, kind of like with the um, – proposition you just made those are completely different but it's another revenue stream now i'm not saying that dentist is going to have six completely different things yeah but when suddenly he takes some of the uh, you know income from his dental practice and invests in r different real estate holdings each one of those real estate holdings becomes a revenue stream even though that side of his business is completely different so i'm not opposed to having different things for me being an entrepreneur uh, it was most it was easiest for me to do it the way I did it. Yeah, absolutely. You've got your podcast, you've got uh, your coaching that you're doing, you've got a uh, dream business academy, you've gotten seven books, you've, you're doing a lot, you got a lot going on. How can people connect with you? Uh, my my home base, if you will, is getjimpalmer.com, www.getjimpalmer.com. Uh, but I started a, um, a free Facebook group okay. around Thanksgiving. Yeah. Just uh, kind of like a little experiment and um, just to give people a little bit of taste of some coaching and I'm in there all the time. In fact, I do free training Tuesdays. That is dream biz group, dream B I Z group.com. That's just a, a URL. Take you to the free Facebook group rather than try and give you that whole long <laughs> extension. But that would be a good place. If you kind of like anything I said in the interview, just connect with me there and, um, we're doing a whole lot of training. You can ask me questions at the website. I'm very accessible in that group. So either get jimpalmer.com or go to Dream Biz Group and uh, join us. And we got like, we just passed 350 small business owners in that group, which wow. is pretty exciting. We'll be right back with Jim Palmer and our rapid fire questions. I want you to take a moment and think about when you were a kid. Do you remember that idea you had? Maybe that dream. Maybe you wanted to grow up and be a firefighter, or a police officer, or a doctor. Well, life has happened and your dreams and ideas have changed, but I'm sure if you think about it for a second, there is a dream and idea that you have that you still want to do. The heartbeat of JumboThink is to help you take that idea and dream and make it a reality. It's never too late to see your big ideas and dreams become reality. So let's start the conversation. Swing on over to JumboThink.com, learn more about how we can help you, and drop us a note. Let's start the conversation and move that dream and idea from the imagination in, into the world of reality. Make sure to swing on over to jumblethink.com and drop us a note. Let's start the conversation. Now let's join our rapid fire questions with Jim Palmer. We're back with Jim Palmer and our rapid fire questions. Jim, you ready for some rapid fire questions? Lay it on me, Michael. Oh, these are a lot of fun. The first question we always ask is, what is one tip you would give someone with a big idea and dream and they don't know where to start. So I would say if you already have the big idea, um, you want to niche it to the fine, go to the head of the pin okay. and start your business that way. Don't be, don't be everything to everybody. And I, I have to give you a part B, no matter yeah. what business you're in, you will earn significantly more income for who you are than what you do. Mm. What you do is the deliverable. Yeah. When you create a name and a brand for yourself, that's attractive. That's going to drive more people to your business than, than the thing that you actually do. Love it. So good. What is one change you'd like to see in the world? Um, well, I'm not going to go with the Miss America cure world hunger, although that would be good. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, it would be a great change, Michael. I'm sorry to be a little silly, but I, I would like to see, I would like to say no politics on social media. Oh, the world would be a better place right there. That would be. <laughs> it sure as heck would be. Get a like 90% better every day, no matter what right there. <laughs> Do you remember when Facebook came out and everybody was like sick of, hey, this is what I had for breakfast? Well, I would take that all day long compared to what I see now. Yeah, I'd watch a couple of stupid cat videos if that's what I had to put up with instead of politics. <laughs> exactly. Oh, so good. What do you want your legacy to be? Good father, grandfather, husband, and he 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 really followed the serve first model. Where do you find your inspiration? Working with other entrepreneurs at all stages. Okay. I, I am inspired by people who make 10 times what I do, and I'm inspired by people who make one-tenth of what I do, but just have this fire in the belly to, mm -hmm. to do more and to be more, and, and they and they have a reason and a purpose for doing that. What is one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? There's a book I read by Gene Simmons of okay. the rock group Kiss. It's yeah. called Me, Inc. Okay. Um, 
it doesn't matter to me if you don't like Kiss or even Gene Simmons, but Me Inc. <laughs> is a really good look at the life of an entrepreneur because really much more than a musician, he's an entrepreneur. Right. And one of the lessons I learned from that book, I'll just share real quick, is that he says, uh, I, I never took a music lesson. Some people go, that's obvious, but he became a very, very successful musician. He never never went to producing school. He's produced some amazing bands, including Van Halen. Yeah. He became an actor. He wanted to start um, giving keynote speeches. He went. He hired the biggest talent agency in the country and say, he said, I want to make $150,000 a speech. He goes, nobody makes that. So he <laughs> fired them, started his own, and he gets $150,000 a speech. Wow. And all he has a very successful multi-million dollar marketing company. Yeah. The whole thing is it, don't let the what if slow you down. If you want to do it, you just go out there and do it. And the, so that's called Me Inc. And then I would also have to give a plug for my book, Just Say Yes, which okay. really is about not only lifestyle, but I've, I've, it's the lessons I've learned as an entrepreneur and doing what Stephanie and I are doing. So Just Say Yes is, is a pretty cool book. Yeah. What is one tool that is significant for the success of your business? I know this is going to upset people because it upsets me, but Skype. Okay. Um, Skype's got its problem. <laughs> But one of the things, because I, I I don't have any local clients. All my clients are all over the country, and I've had clients in like seven different countries. And we connect on Skype, um, and then uh, a lot of my clients, we do Skype video because they want to see me and yeah. we interact. Yeah. So um, Skype video, as, as, as old-fashioned as that might be in this day <laughs> and age, Skype video is pretty important to me. On the same note, what is one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Eliminating the excuses. Okay. You can either have results or excuses, but you can't have both. And by the way, a lot of people think they have reasons why things aren't happening, but in reality, they're excuses. Yeah. The really, the if again, if you look at the top one percent, you will not find an excuse maker in the bunch. Wow. No way. Yeah. Look at Richard Branson yeah. and, and Mark Cuban and all these people. The, nothing will stop them. Nothing's going to get in their way, let alone something petty like I'm afraid to give a speech, but <laughs> nothing is going to stop them yeah. from it. And so they, they, they really embody the no excuses. And that's really what's required to create amazing success. I, I found that really fascinating that you say that because I've never thought of, uh, of that 1% group as the no excuses bunch, but really they are. And that's, it's a really powerful observation. Uh, I love it. I've studied a lot of those. I mean, listen, I've wanted to be very successful for a long period. Of time, <laughs> and I've read, I just read constantly. And, but I read books. Uh, I, I like to read books from uh, on topics that I like, but I like to read books of people who have already achieved massive success. Yeah. And I like to read, and I sometimes will read between the lines of, of the ego and stuff like that. But I look for things. And in all of these cases, and I see them on TV or I YouTube them, and I'm like, these guys do not lack for confidence. <laughs> they don't lack for, you know, if, if somebody said, uh, sorry, you can't do that. He says, Oh, watch yeah. me. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and, and so many people I see get stopped because they are risk averse. Yeah. That's the other thing I think that would have to go with that. Michael is yeah. But what if it doesn't work? And you know, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of things and reasons that hold people back from ultimately going for what it is they want to they're they they just want to eliminate as much risk as possible and i'm not saying that's not a good thing but sooner or later if you don't pull the trigger you're going to wake up and you're going to be like you know <laughs> however old you're going to be and it's going to be far right. too long be before that exists that opportunity has yeah. gone that's so good i'm i'm a, a, actually really interested about the next question uh because you live such a a unique life from uh the standard entrepreneur or business person or, or employee, how do you start and finish your day? Uh, in prayer, oh, specifically giving thanks. Okay. Um, one thing one thing I learned in 2001, um, the other part of the thing about getting cancer, well, in, in 2001, in 2000, I lost my job. But here, you know, I was major um, income provider for the family stuff, yeah. and he was also doing some things. But we had four young kids, or and I'm sorry, at the time we had four teenagers, and I was VP of marketing for this company. I lost my job. Wow. And then a year into that, I was still unemployed, which just wrecked my confidence. But yeah. then I got cancer. So I call that my season of crisis, Michael. Yeah. But it made going through that made me who I am today. And it obviously made me far more appreciative for the good things in life. I'm able to weather bad things because I know ultimately there's a plan and things like that. But 
what I find to be very, very helpful because I have dark days like everybody. I, yeah. I, I even say, I don't know what's going on. I'm moody as hell. I don't know why, <laughs> but I'll probably wake up better tomorrow. I yeah. just know that about myself. But what helps me in those times is when I, I give thanks and, you know, I, for, for my wife, for my kids, for my grandkids, for this amazing adventure we're on, for my boat, for my my parents are alive, Stephanie's parents are alive, my family, I've got amazing clients. And when you start going down that list, um, it, it's like, what the hell am I thinking about? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah. so just start your day. Don't start your day and, and turn on, you know, Fox or MSNBC or, or don't start reading, <laughs> you know, some uh, horrible negative crap because that, yeah. that, that will affect your mindset. Yeah. The other thing, and I've, I have had a, a, a struggle with this most of my life. People are going to, what, alcohol or something? No, not that. <laughs> but I've struggled being a news junkie. Yeah. And there are so many times and I think, I got to know what's going on. Yeah. Next thing you know, I've watched two hours of two people people screaming at each other and it's like oh the world's going to hell in a handbasket yeah. and it's just two people screaming at each other yeah. right and so one of the one of the real blessings of being on the boat when we moved on the boat we were um in april the boat had been in a a, a winter slip which means it had a, a big roof over it so you know we didn't get the weather on it and therefore we got no tv so for the first <laughs> several months uh, we did not have any TV at all, and we didn't miss it because we were like two kids in a candy. So look at this. Oh, my gosh. Look at this sunset. Look at that. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. And it's like we didn't miss it at all, and I do not watch news anymore. Now, I'm not oblivious to what's going on. I mean, it's pretty hard not to see it. I mean, you can open a browser, and whether it's <laughs> Yahoo or something, you're going to see a headline right, or two, right. right? But I do not spend hours watching things that – First of all, are always going to be negative because that's the only way they'll get ratings. Number two, I, I fully realize what I'm able to control in my life is right here. Yeah. I can control what I do, yeah. how I react, how I treat people, how I market my business, how I treat my clients. Those are things that are within my control. What's going on in Washington or somewhere else around the world? I may care about it, but ultimately, if I spend 10 minutes or 10 hours gnashing my teeth about it, it will not change the outcome. And I think when you realize that and you focus on good things and things that are, are just a blessing in your life, and believe me, Stephanie and I do some work with underprivileged people, and I see people who, who have next to nothing, but they're happy, right? you know, because they focus on what's important. It's a real eye-opener. So anyway, that was that's probably a very long answer, but <laughs> yeah, give, give thanks yeah. and look at all the good things in your life. Do that when you wake up. And do it when you go when you go to sleep. Yeah. And you, you just see what happens in a matter of days or certainly a couple of weeks. You're going to be a different person. Yeah. Love it. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing? I got to be honest. I have no freaking <laughs> clue. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's so weird. You know, one thing I've come to realize is that I had no idea I would be a business owner when I was 30. I yeah. always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I worked for entrepreneurs, but little did I know that this is what I'd be doing. And when I became an entrepreneur, I, I, I was good at marketing and newsletters. That's how I created the business. Little did I know when I was 42 that, you know, when I was the age I am now that I'd be coaching these people all over the, this country and other countries. I yeah. mean, I don't know. So what would I be doing? I honest, I'm sure I'd be making a living somehow. <laughs> I, I would hope that I'd have a chance to inspire and motivate because I really, I really enjoy that part of my life. Maybe that makes me a pastor <laughs> or maybe it makes me a motivational speaker, but my, I can't say, oh, well, I'd definitely be a ball player. That I just, Michael, that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> What is uh, one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? There's something that Stephanie and I are talking about now. Okay. When we moved on the boat, we sort of agreed to an 18-month plan. We're a year in, and we're already going three to five years. Wow. Okay, you know, th we're having way too much fun. Yeah. Um, but there's something called the great loop. Okay. And I'm not hundred percent sure we're both committed to this, but it's the big thing we're thinking about uh, besides next year, next winter, we're going to go to the Bahamas. Okay. We'll take the boat across the ocean wow. or however far that is to the Bahamas. Yeah. But there's a thing called the great loop where you can go all the way up the coast of the United States. You can go through New York into Canada, the great lakes, come down through Chicago, ultimately down the Mississippi, come out the Gulf of Mexico. You can circumnavigate the whole eastern part of the United States by boat. It takes about a year to do wow. it. But we're actually thinking about that. It'd be a full year of our life. But I think you'd see parts of this country that you will never see from from I-95 or, yeah. you know, some other turnpike. Yeah. Um, it would be a big commitment because, uh, you know, we'd be away from the family for a while unless we kind of flew home once in a while. But that's a really big thing we're thinking about. We've come to no decision. But one thing is for sure, we love this lifestyle 
and we're getting to see parts of this country and we're meeting people that we would have never met. So we're really enjoying that. So that's, that's kind of what I have to say about that. As we wrap up today's episode, what's one last thought you want to leave us with? I want to, I want people to just say yes more often. Okay. Um, nothing against Nancy Reagan, just say no <laughs> from the eighties with drugs, but too many people say no. Right. And the, you know, I saw this great video. There's a a rapper who turned poet. His name is Prince EA. Okay. And he says they in this video, you can look it up. He goes, uh, everybody, everybody dies, but not everybody lives. I think it's close to that title. Yeah. But in this video, he says, uh, they interviewed a bunch of people that were pretty near death on their deathbed. And they said, what do you regret in life? And to a person, nobody could think of something they regretted, but they could think of many, many things they regretted not doing. Yeah. Right. Because it's not prudent. It's not safe. And I don't mean like, you know, get stick in your hand in a tiger cage, but <laughs> because because society says, oh, that's Jim. I don't know if you should spend that kind of money in a boat this close to retirement yeah. <laughs> or you should not be living. You know, you should not be out in the ocean. You haven't had a captain's course and whatever it is. If you let too much of societal's influence about what should be safe, predictable and, you know, the, the prudent lifestyle and whatever it is. I mean, I'm talking with a gentleman now who's 62 years old, very close to retirement. But he said, I've just got a dream of being an entrepreneur. Wow. I don't know if it's too late. I said, wow. the hell it is. Yeah. Do you know Colonel Sanders started his business? Business. I think he was 65. Wow. I mean, when he started selling chicken, I yeah. mean, it's never too late. And I think I, I came up with this expression after uh, watching that Prince EA video. I put my own spin on it. I said, regret tastes like crap. Yeah. Do things that you're thinking about, do things you're dreaming about, and don't wait for tomorrow. Uh, I'll leave you with one expression that I says, this is not a dress rehearsal, right? Yeah. What, whoever you are listening, you are on the main stage right now. And sooner or later, that curtain is going to come down. You've got to give your best performance now. You will not get another chance. So good. So good. Jim, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, thanks for inspiring us with living a lifestyle that that really reinforces what you believe in and taking the risks and stepping out and and doing crazy cool things. It's, it's truly something that I think uh, all of us uh, uh, are encouraged by. So thanks for taking time out and being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I think you're doing a, a, a good service. I think you're bringing a lot of people, generational people together and things like that, Michael. So I applaud you. If I can give one more one yeah. more uh, website, because yeah. people may not be interested in business and things like that, but Stephanie and I have a blog called OurFloatingHome.com. Our boat oh, is cool. called Floating Home. Yeah. OurFloatingHome.com. And I know for a fact there's different people who've read that. And one person, this is so cool, one person Facebook messaged me today <laughs> It's, this is when you realize you got a little bit of a reach, but it's also, oh my God, what a hefty responsibility. People are actually listening to me. Yeah. They sold their house. They're not doing a boat. They're doing an RV. Wow. He said, we're doing it, Jim. And we've been following you. You've inspired us. Now, I don't know what degree. I don't, I'm not going to take credit for it all, obviously, but if people, if they want to, and Stephanie's writing most of the blog posts about our trips and our travels and some of the messes we get into, but ourfloatinghome.com is just a, a personal blog about about our big adventure on the boat somebody might find that interesting cool thanks so much uh i'm gonna go check it out right now uh thanks again for being on the podcast thanks a lot michael have a great one once again we want to thank today's guest captain jim palmer for taking time out to share his story and give us some insights into the world of entrepreneurship and taking risks and adventure as always, you can find the links we discussed in today's episode in the episode notes and at jumblethink.com. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to encourage you, if you haven't gotten the free guides that we're offering at jumblethink.com, swing on over right now. Our first guide is how to know when you found your dream. And our second guide is overcoming the unknown. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash guide to download your free guides today. Well, that brings us to the end of another Jumble Think episode. I want to thank you for tuning in and listening today. I hope that this episode has encouraged you to take some steps into the unknown and to take and create a lifestyle of adventure. Now it's up to you. So get out there and do something to move that big idea and dream forward and change the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.